Artemis, the Greek goddess of the hunt, chastity, and the moon, has been revered for millennia and stands as a feminist icon. Despite her mythical deeds, including turning a peeping tom into a stag, Artemis has remained a symbol of strength and independence. NASA's decision to name a trailblazing mission after her, aiming to land the first woman and first person of color on the moon, is a fitting tribute. This tradition of naming missions after Zeus' progeny, such as Mercury, Gemini, and Apollo, underscores the significance of Artemis in space exploration, culminating in the establishment of the Artemis program in 2017. Welcome to my channel. Before starting, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more future updates. So, let's start. NASA's Artemis program, in collaboration with international space agencies like the ESA and CSA, as well as private corporations, aims to re-establish a human presence on the moon for the first time since 1972 and sustain it. This mission's genesis traces back to the Constellation program of the early 2000s, which aimed for a lunar landing by 2020. Artemis reproposes elements of this earlier initiative, including the Ares-1, Ares-5, and Orion crew exploration vehicle. However, the program faced setbacks, with then-President Barack Obama canceling certain components in 2010 to prioritize Mars exploration, which catalyzed the development of the SLS space launch system. This rocket, NASA's most powerful to date, is integral to realizing the Artemis mission's objectives. The Artemis program received a significant boost in December 2017 when former President Donald Trump signed Space Policy Directive 1, SPD-1, which outlined a U.S.-led integrated program with private sector partners for a human return to the moon and subsequent missions to Mars and beyond. Two years later in 2019, then-Vice President Mike Pence announced an acceleration of the program's goals, pushing the moon landing up by four years to 2024. Despite NASA's demonstrated capability to land people on the moon, the challenge lies in sustaining life there due to its harsh conditions. With no breathable atmosphere, liquid water, weak gravity, and extreme temperature swings, supplying power, heat, atmosphere, and water for the colonists becomes a critical issue, requiring careful planning and multiple trips for resupply from Earth to the lunar surface and back. But high-risk, high-reward logistical nightmares are kind of NASA's whole deal. As such, the Artemis program is split between SLS missions, which will eventually bring the human crew to the moon, and the support missions, which will bring, well, basically everything else. That includes robotic rovers, the human landing system, as well as moon base and gateway components, along with all the logistical support and infrastructure stuff that they'll require. The SLS missions form the backbone of NASA's deep space exploration system, featuring the SLS Super Heavy Lift Launch Vehicle, Orion spacecraft, and exploration ground systems at Kennedy Space Center. The SLS stands as humanity's most powerful rocket, designed with a modular, evolvable structure for future adaptability. Its initial Block 1 configuration, equipped with RS-25 engines and solid rocket boosters, provides significant thrust, enabling payloads of up to 27 metric tons to reach the moon at speeds exceeding 24,500 miles per hour. The upcoming Block 1B variant, incorporating an additional exploration upper stage, promises enhanced payload capacity, capable of lifting 38 tons out of Earth's gravity well. The ultimate Block 2 configuration, towering over 30 stories tall and delivering 9.2 million pounds of thrust, is poised to shoulder the heavy lifting in ferrying crews and cargo to the moon. Riding atop the SLS, the Orion spacecraft represents a new era in crewed space exploration, boasting advanced life support, navigation, and propulsion systems. Supported by the European Space Agency ESA, Orion features a robust launch abort system, ensuring crew safety during liftoff by swiftly ejecting the crew capsule in case of emergencies. The Orion spacecraft's main cabin, with dimensions just under 16 feet tall and over 16 feet in diameter, is equipped with a four-wing solar array generating 11 kilowatts of power. Its attached service module contains sufficient air and water to sustain the crew for up to three weeks. At the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, the Artemis program's exploration ground systems encompass critical infrastructure, including the Vehicle Assembly Building, Launch Control Center, Firing Rooms, Mobile Launchers, Crawlers, and Launch Pads. Notably, Launch Pad 39B NASA has outlined a comprehensive schedule of Artemis missions, starting with Artemis 1, an unmanned launch in November, followed by Artemis 2 in 2024, carrying live astronauts for the first time, 
Artemis 3 in 2025 expected to land on the moon, and subsequent missions delivering components for the Lunar Gateway. To build confidence in survival on the moon, Artemis support missions, like the Capstone and VIPER rover deployments, confirm orbital paths, and search for water ice in the moon's South Pole craters, laying crucial groundwork for future lunar and interplanetary exploration. Finding a source for H2O is of paramount importance to the long-term viability of the colony in space. Water isn't just for drinking and bathing. It can be split into its component atoms and used to fuel our oxidizing rockets, potentially turning the moon into an orbital gas station as we push further out from Earth. The rover and other colony-assisting robots will be delivered to the surface as part of NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Program, the CLPS. Similarly, any habitat established on the surface will need an ample supply of electricity to remain online. Solar charging is one obvious choice, but NASA has never been one to underprepare and has already selected three aerospace companies to develop nuclear power sources for potential deployment. In addition to a surface installation, NASA plans on putting a full-fledged space station, dubbed the Lunar Gateway, into orbit around the Moon, where it will serve much the same purpose as the ISS does today. Visiting researchers will stay aboard the Pressurized Habitation and Logistics Outpost Module or HALO, where they'll have access to research facilities, remote rover controls, and docking for both Orion capsules from Earth and HLS landers to the Moon's surface. A 60-kilowatt solar plant will provide power to the station, which also serves as a communications relay hub back to the planet. The Gateway will very much be an international operation. As NASA points out, Canada's CSA is providing advanced robotics for use upon the station. The ESA is supplying a second living module, called the International Habitat or IHAB, as well as the ESBRIDE communications module and an array of research CubeSats. Japan's JXA will kick in additional habitat components and assist with resupply logistics from the Gateway. Astronauts and researchers will descend to the Moon's surface via the Human Landing System HLS, a reusable lunar lander program managed at the Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. NASA selected SpaceX's Starship as the initial HLS, with significant funding awarded for its development. This spacecraft, adapted from the base Starship design, will enable lunar exploration and operations. Equipped with spacewalk equipment from Axiom Space and Collins Aerospace, researchers can safely navigate the lunar surface, supported by new lunar terrain vehicles akin to NASA's original lunar rovers. This setup ensures that exploration efforts on the Moon extend beyond mere observation, enabling sample collection, experimentation, and detailed observations to advance our understanding of Earth's celestial neighbor. NASA is currently developing unpressurized lunar terrain vehicles LTVs, with plans to finalize proposals by next year and have them operational by 2028. When not in use, these vehicles will be stationed at NASA's Artemis Base Camp at the Lunar South Pole, alongside pressurized versions intended for longer-duration missions. The surface habitat at the base camp will accommodate up to four residents at a time, offering essential amenities such as communications equipment, storage, power, and robust radiation shielding. While the specific site for the base camp has not been officially selected, mission planners are targeting areas near permanently shadowed craters where water ice is anticipated to be readily available. Despite challenging conditions like extreme cold and perpetual darkness, the habitat is expected to evolve with each subsequent trip, becoming more capable and comfortable for researchers staying there for extended periods. Ultimately, the base camp serves as a crucial stepping stone for future interplanetary exploration, including missions to Mars. This is it for today's video. What do you think of our video? Feel free to share your thoughts in the comments section below. Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel for more future updates. Thanks for watching.